Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to AWC's webinar number 32. Uh, my name is Alex Bassini. I'm the business development manager here um, at AWC. Today we're covering smart chemical dosing. Uh, we're joined by Quinton and from ICA from Alutra uh, down in New Zealand. Um, thank you for, for being here, guys. Uh, we have done chemical dosing before. Uh, however, this is uh, going beyond that. It's not just the traditional approach that we would stick to, to, to just, you know, your your typical, you know, whether it's chemical disinfection or oxidation or, or polymers. This is going a little beyond that. Um, I know that you're you're logging in for from a different time zone, different part of the world here. So thank you for being up early for this. Um, before we get started, just a little uh, short note on some of the webinars that we've been working on. Yes, this is number 36. Uh, we're really going through these. If anybody's missed any of them, we do have some recordings. Uh, all the recordings are there and we should have a link there at the very end where you can go in there. The wastewater reuse recording, while it's available, it's still not live just yet, so we'll, we'll send that out there so anybody that wants to redo it. Um, oddly enough, wastewater reuse, uh, we actually had quite a few emails that, that came back with questions on it afterwards, so thank you for all of those that sent some questions in. Um, a quick short uh, bit about AWC, if you don't know who we are, we've been around for 40 years. We design and build water treatment plants. We have close to 600 uh, packaged plants worldwide. Uh, we divide everything into potable plants, wastewater plants, and skid-mounted systems. Um, so this is kind of what we do. So um, with that, we're going to go ahead and start with the smart chemical dosing. Quinton, go ahead, take it away. Excellent. Thank you for that, Alex, and, and thank you for uh, having us on today. It's a real pleasure to be here. So um, just as, as Alex said, we're talking about smart chemical dosing today, um, and we'll be doing a particular focus on water treatment and with coagulation. Uh, we also have some uh, later slides which kind of talk around the wastewater piece as well. Uh, just before we get into this, um, I want to give a really quick intro on who Lutra are and a little bit of background on where we come from. So. Founded in 2006, Lutra, we started our life as a process engineering company. And so with that, we've developed over time, um, building, designing and troubleshooting plants across New Zealand and the sort of Australasia region. And that's in both the water and wastewater area. Um, as part of this, we have developed a couple of products to support our engineering team. Um, so one which we're not going to talk about today is infrastructure data and essentially infrastructure data gathers data from your water treatment plant, wastewater plants, field data, lab data, puts it in one place and helps you optimize that uh, performance monitoring, but also monitor compliance and report on that. The one which we're going to focus on today is what we called Compass. So the idea behind Compass is exactly that, looking at your changing uh, raw water conditions and then based on that, um, uh, automatically changing your dose rates. I'm going to hand over to Ike now, who will lead you through the rest of the presentation. Okay, thank you very much, Quentin. Yes, so as Quentin already indicated, uh, the conditions of the incoming water stream for drinking water as well as wastewater treatment plants is quite variable. So in a drinking water, for example, uh, plotted here as an example on the right hand side um, is the turbidity and the organic matter load coming in uh, plotted over time over a couple of days. Um, and you see a uh, plant's peak of turbidity and the organic matter composition uh, indicated as a UV254 measurement around the 20th, 21st of June. So what does it mean for the drinking water plant in this case? Uh, the coagulant dosage would have to be adjusted accordingly uh, to remove these components from the water to obtain uh, good quality clear drinking water. And generally plants do this uh, to some extent automatically, of course, also using streaming current devices, measuring the zeta potential or manually with jar tests by the operators and using fixed dosing set points. The issue with those is that they are not accurate enough and particularly not timely enough until the analysis are done. And um, using a manual control particularly often results in either as there's a risk for underdosage or actually also overdosage to be on the safe side and a slower response time, which has increased running costs and obviously also a harsher environmental impact uh, by the use of those chemicals uh, for coagulation. And so if we take a bit of a closer look here, um, basically on a standard drinking water plant, um, indicated in this plot here. We have our raw water intake on the left and it goes through all our 
general processes of coagulation, flocculation, sedimentation through a filter, a disinfected basin, and again then in the end after corrosion control into reticulation. What Lutra has done a few years ago is developing Compass. Compass is basically a, a combination of online measurements of turbidity sensors at the incoming water stream, which are usually there in the water treatment plant, as well as uh, inline, the use of inline spectrophotometry. And with that, we get a quite detailed information on the composition of the water and in a feed forward process to the compass module uh, can already adjust the coagulation, coagulation dosage, excuse me. And there is also, as you see further plotted on the right hand side after the sedimentation basin, another spectral sensor which can provide a feedback loop for even more precise fine tuning of the coagulation dosage. And uh, in an addition, also the whole process gives information of the formation potential of the disinfection byproducts and actually also a tighter control of those, so a reduction. The uh, effect of this is a significant reduction of chemical usage and of course also of cost and relatively short return of investment times between a few months to maximum about two years. And that of course depends on the plant size. If we look uh, as an example here on the Performance um, in comparison, uh, so of the compass uh, dosage control in comparison to uh, stream, streaming uh, current meter or streaming current device. Again, plotted in on the right hand side on the top uh, is the um, incoming water stream with showing a turbidity peak um, plotted in black here, and as well as the organic matter composition expressed as dissolved organic carbon, DOC. Um, following a similar peak after say a rain event or something like this uh, around the 24th of May. You see the turbidity peak is uh, coming first and then followed a little bit later by the organic matter load increasing and then slowly um, dropping off over the few days. Um, in the plot below you see the response and actually the uh, coagulation dosage control um, prescripted by the SCM, the streaming current meter, as well as by the compass module. And the you see that the compass module follows very closely first the turbidity increase and then later on also the uh, DOC load. And exactly with the end of the peak of the DOC load reduces its dosage, dosage again, while in plotted in red, the SCM continues to increase for an, uh, with the dosage uh, for another about five and a half hours and then uh, overdoses for uh, quite a few days until the two come to um, sort of agreement again, so to say, on this. And the effect of that is uh, basically an overdosage of about 20% directly translating to a cost saving using the compass module uh, by about 20% and obviously also increased filter run times further down in the plant of about 24%. This is a live example here from a plant in New Zealand and um, also reducing operator uh, call out rates. Uh, in a case study, for example, for Wellington water in a plant producing 60 megalitres um, a day, um, this translates to cost savings about 650 New Zealand, 650,000 uh, New Zealand dollars per year. And uh, at that plant, we had a return of investment in only three months. Compass is available in different modules. So there's a general module for turbidity uh, removal in drinking water called just Compass. The Compass EOR uh, also for drinking water is what I described in the plot before, um, which has an advanced, hence the name uh, organics removal. And uh, there are two wastewater components for increased phosphate removal or also for chemically enhanced pretreatment. Compass uh, globally, it has been around for a few years now, and we have about 70 installations, which mainly are in the Australian New Zealand realm as well as in the UK. That's it. Thank you so much. <laughs> OK, excellent. That was short and sweet. I know that we were going to allow for a little bit more time uh, for mm -hmm. questions. I had kind of uh, my list of questions here, um, but can you just go back? Oh, I know that you were there on that slide. Um, if you don't mind going back to one of those slides that you had or I can do it on my end. Um, so if we go, oh, let me double check here. Um, if you go back to that slide, you were showing. Oh, let me make sure that I'm here. Um, 
You can see my screen there, right? Yep. So I see here that you're monitoring uh, some of the data at multiple points. So That's correct. Are you, are you monitoring data at each injection point or are you just going throughout the whole process and taking multiple samples uh, to, uh, I guess, tweak or, or adjust in order to op optimize the chemical dosing? There are two uh, standard measurement points here in a drinking water plant. So that's actually the, at the raw water intake. We, as, as, as I said, we, we measure the turbidity as well as uh, with a spectrophotometer and in an online flow through spectrophotometer, um, the different components, say, of the organic load. So that's actually looking quite detailed at different wavelengths in the UV spectrum of what is coming in. And from that, we can also get information on the disinfection byproduct uh, formation potential. And then after the uh, coagulation and flocculation process, basically, after the sedimentation basin, we measure again to get a feedback loop and further fine tune this whole system. So that's at these two points. And the uh, other uh, points basically you could measure at in that sense are not um, that that's basically not not relevant for this direct coagulation flocculation process. Um, I should also add that this whole system is plant specific, so the algorithms running in the compass system are being adjusted specifically to each treatment plant or also wastewater plant per se. So there's a period of time after the installation where this process runs is being closely supervised, uh, further fine tuned, adjusted before it's fully handed over. Uh, often at first it runs at a sort of um, advisory mode to the operators before it's going into full automation mode. Right, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, you you had mentioned, oh, I'm sorry. I, I know that mm -hmm. there's a couple questions here that are coming in, but I, I had some, mm -hmm. <laughs> some here. Uh, you had um, included UVT uh, monitoring in there. I'm a big yeah. advocate of UVT monitoring. I know that sometimes it gets ignored and it'll end up, you know, going to a lab because they'd rather take a look at, uh, mm -hmm. you know, TOC, VOC, or organics or color for that matter. Um, what are you using the 254 nanometer UVT uh, measurement for? It's it's a component basically of the spectrophotometric measurements. So the spectrophotometer can measure UVT SAC254. So it uses a range of wavelength, the UVT just as the as a as as you know, a, a direct measurement of um, um the UV absorption at that wavelength or UV transmission per se, obviously, hence the name. But uh, we're also using turbidity or, or particle uh, interference corrected measurements at a range of wavelengths in addition to that. So it's not just the UVT measurement, it's these others in addition. But you can get from this instrument also the direct UVT measurements themselves. Okay, all right, that, that makes sense. I, I kept thinking that it had something to do with, well, I guess it's a combination of turbidity organics and, and the readouts that you can get with 250 with, with yeah, the yeah. Uh, UVT transmittance monitoring. OK, yeah, I have yeah. a question here from Andrew. Uh, so it says, where are the limits of performance? Are there any limits for alkalinity, turbidity, TDS, hardness, where the accuracy breaks down? I think um, particularly we can have some challenges here is where you do have um, really large flood events and your turbidity is kind of hitting, you know, maybe 600 to 1,000 into you. Uh, we have seen the sensor work um, just recently, actually, in, in a New Zealand case here again, up to over 600 NTU, and, and it stayed accurate during that time and, and carried on dosing. But at some point, you will hit that limit, and and particularly around like 254 and the likes. Um, you know, eventually, you just cannot see through the water; it's it's turning to almost mud. Um, so you do hit some sort of high performance levels of you know some performance limits there which will sort of cap us out, um, at which point we would likely hand over to an operator to, you know, take back control of that. Um, in terms of the other ones, Ica, do you have any suggestions around? Yes. Um, uh, I should, I should, not? Um, and not directly to that. So that's probably something we have to, have to discuss directly with our developers and, and operators here. But we should add that um, to allow for a wide range of operation. We have some plants here, as Kundan already described, which can show after strong rain event a significant increase in turbidity far beyond what you normally have. And particularly um, in those cases, a, a spectrophotometric measurement or also turbidity meter has certain 
uh, detection windows. So what we do in these cases is that we have a second set of instruments next to that, which are only there for these high loads when our standard set has left the detection window. So the measurements coming in and also going in the dosage control, that's actually not limited per se, as long as you have the right instrumentation installed. And um, that is definitely possible. And usually in these rare cases where you have really turbidity shooting up into a thousand or something like that, uh, where we switch to another instrument, which the rest of the time just sits on idle and producing uh, low house numbers, so to say, because that's below than what they normally do. So we use the data from the instrument, which are designed and, and calibrated for these um, conditions. So that works really well. Um, clearly, uh, pH control is an important factor or alkalinity, but that's done separately in, in this in this process. And uh, how that can be tied in with Compass is really something we have to uh, talk to our engineers. Yeah, but they are used in a wide range of plants which experience a wide range of uh, strongly changing environmental conditions. OK, so I have another question in here, but I think it had already been answered. Could you describe what the spectral sensor is actually measuring? Um, if you're to say, you know, some of the top three or four data points that the uh, spectral sensor is measuring, which ones mm -hmm. are the most important? So if you're to eliminate the, you know, everything else, what are the top, let's say, four yeah. that you absolutely need? Well, we would giving away a little bit there on, on what they do, but what I can clearly say is that um, they measure, I mean, we'd already talked about uh, 254. So, and it's measuring uh, UVT 254 as well as SAC 254. And it does the same at different wavelengths below that. Um, we use, if, if you got a, a very simple water, so to say, and you don't need disinfection byproducts, you can operate this almost on just SAC 254, but, we use uh, another about five specific wavelengths from the spectral photometer, which are corrected to turbidity interference, which is specific to these algorithms to also get the disinfection byproduct potential. So um, that, those are in the lower UV range. In addition, what you can get from a setup like that is you can also uh, measure A, you get your organic load, you can get TOC, but you can also just, just also for the monitoring aspects of that, but you can also uh, measure the incoming nitrate, uh, which in some plants or particularly in a, in a uh, sadly also in our country in some with some groundwater sources play an important role. So having high quality spectrophotometer there, which has the right algorithms on it, you can get very, very accurate uh, nitrate measurements online within a few seconds, so to say. So react to those as well are further options. OK, and then I had a one last question here from Ryan. So it says, to what extent does the physical layout of the plant, sampling, injection points, et cetera, impact the responsiveness of the equipment? I guess it depends on the size of plant. Yeah, can you? Can you Talk a bit more on that. I mean, we have a wide range of, of, of plans, as I said, of varying sizes there. So okay. Well, there, yeah, there's yeah, kind so. of a follow-up there that says, are there general guidelines for these placements? So you know, you had mentioned. I know you think in in, in liters, uh, million mi million liters per day. But if we were to mm -hmm. do a, you know, a 10 mgd versus 120 mgd plant, um, yeah. Are there yeah, guidelines so, for these? So generally, with um, I mean, we've we've done uh, some other. Other trials on plants, um, for example, in Singapore, where they will have the four different reservoirs and they will often switch between them. Um, generally, in terms of the placement, we really just need to see what that raw water coming into your plant is. So um, if you have multiple process chains or multiple inlets, we would kind of put these um, sampling points across those inlets. So just to really understand what your, what's in your raw water. Um, in terms of any sort of feedback control, generally we put this after some of the filtration or sedimentation barriers, as sort of Ike mentioned. Um, the reason being that's where we actually bring back the trim. So we can see at the end of, a, let's say, a clarifier, how much excess uh, chemicals we've actually got there. So we can further trim that algorithm back. Um, generally, what we do is whenever someone's actually interested in this, our engineers will come in and spend some time with them up front um, and generally get a good understanding of that plant process, and then we can actually give you more specific guidelines on where we'd need to sample within that plant to get the best yeah. sort of results. So everything is, it's a it's a generic product, but it is uh, tuned for specific plants, if that makes of any course. sense. 
Yeah. yeah, no, 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 that does. Well, thank you very much for your time. We, we promised that we were going to keep this at 20 minutes and we're at exactly 21 minutes, so it's time to wrap up. Uh, with that, um, if anybody has any questions, I've included your contact information there. Please uh, feel free to, to, to reach out. We do have some um, upcoming webinars coming in in the next couple of weeks. So we're doing electrocoagulation. We're going to do a little bit more of a ceramic membrane. Um, uh, I guess follow up because we've done it before, but we're going to go a little bit more into what, what specific ceramic membranes and some pilots that we can do along with water risk management. Um, if anybody's missed any of these, we do have the YouTube channel in there. Um, everybody will be getting a link shortly with recording for this. So with that, thank you very much for your time and I will see you again in two weeks. Goodbye. Bye guys. Thank you.